Welcome everyone. My name is Ruth Wilcock and I'm the Executive Director of the Ontario Brain Injury Association. And we thank you for joining our webinar today. Obaya has been educating people in the field of brain injury for close to 35 years. We are pleased to be partnering with the Brain Changes Initiative on this webinar series. The founder of Brain Changes is Dr. Matthew Galati, who sustained a very severe brain injury in 2013. However, he was able to return to medical school and now is a fully licensed physician. Today, we are fortunate to have two speakers. The first is Barbara Aerosmith Young. And today's presentation, uh, or Barbara's presentation, is supported and sponsored by Pace Law Firm. I want to say that we are very grateful for Pace Law Firm's sponsorship of Obaya throughout the years. I'd like to now introduce to you Nick Simone from Pace Law Firm to say a few words. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Nick Simone. I'm the president of Pace Law Firm. And we are very, very proud to, to be a sponsor of today's event. Um, Pace Law Firm this year also has a milestone. We're celebrating 40 years as a, as a firm. And we've always supported uh, the uh, OBIA and, and obviously are very, very happy to be a sponsor of, of today. We also uh, know Dr. Matthew Galati very well in his story, and we're very supportive of his, uh, of his initiatives. Um, so congratulations to Dr. Galati. With that, uh, I have the pleasure today of introducing um, Barbara uh, Aerosmith Young. And I just have a few words to say about her. Barbara Aerosmith Young is the founder of the Aerosmith uh, program. It's an assessment process and a suite of cognitive exercises designed to stimulate and strengthen weak areas of cognitive functioning that underlie a range of learning dif uh, difficulties, uh, which has been delivered for 40 years plus through, throughout the world. Uh, beginning in 1978, her work has been recognized as one of the first examples of the practical application of neuroplasticity. The genesis of Aerosmith's program, cog, uh, program's cognitive exercise lies in Barbara Aerosmith's young journey of discovery and innovation to overcome her severe learning disabilities. Her ins inspirational book, The Woman Who Changed Her Brain, has become an international bestseller and a third edition updated with the new research was published in December of 2009. Barbara is also the recipient of the 2009 Leaders and Legends Innovations Award from the Ontario Institute of Studies and Education at the University of Toronto for her outstanding contributions to education in Ontario. So with that, please welcome um, Barbara Aerosmith Young. We look forward to your presentation. Unmute myself. All right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for that uh, lovely introduction. Um, so I'm just uh, I'm confessing right now that one of my brothers says I'm technologically incompetent. So and he's probably not far wrong. So let me just see if I can get my slides up. So uh, someone can tell you are the slide are they there? Uh, yes, they're there. We can okay. See. Good. Good. Because I I can't. I just see them on my screen, so thank you. Okay, and, and if there is a problem, please let me know. Um, so I just want to say thank you for uh, inviting me to present today. Um, and it's not a secret that I'm incredibly passionate about the human brain and how it drives behavior, how it shapes who we are, its incredible capacity for change. And I really believe if we can delineate and understand the principles of neuroplasticity, we can apply these to benefit people worldwide. So my life and my work has been and continues to be an exploration of the territory of the human brain and how it makes us uniquely who we are, how understanding this territory can give us compassionate insight into our functioning and into the functioning of others. So today I wanna to share a little bit of what I've learned uh, over the past 40 years on uh, this journey. So, the, um, the vision of Aerosmith is to transform lives by strengthening cognitive capacities through the application of neuroplastic principles. 
Uh, Norman Deutsch, who probably many of you know, he's here in Toronto, uh, the author of The Brain That Changes Itself and The Brain's Way of Healing, comments on the, the benefit of um, our work. And he says, the fact that Aerosmith trains the brain processors that make possible reasoning and rationality is arguably one of the most important positive developments one could imagine for our world and its complex problems. And our, our mission is to make this work accessible around the world. We're now in 12 countries uh, in over 90 organizations and we, we uh, train people to implement uh, this work. So what have I learned uh, over the past 40 plus years? Hopefully a few things. Uh, and I'm still in awe of the complexity of our brains and hence the complexity of the learning process. Science has taught us that our brain has a significant role in shaping who we are. Uh, this organ that we carry around in our heads, we really can't escape it, uh, it goes with us everywhere we go, has something on the order of 100 billion neurons. Some researchers say it's a mere 86 billion neurons, uh, but still that's a lot of neurons. And it has something on the order of several hundred trillion connections. So this complex organ filters our perceptions and our understanding of ourselves, of others, of our world, and of our relationship to that world. And to me, what's fascinating is no two brains are exactly alike. So if you think of someone you know, and you note all of your physical differences, so eye color, shape of your nose, height, there are actually more differences between each of your brains than all of your physical differences combined. So simply put, your brain makes you uniquely you. And this complex organ does shape who we are. And to me, what's so promising is that we know that through the application of the principles of neuroplasticity, we can actually shape our brains. Uh, neuroplasticity just means that the brain is capable of change. We know we can grow dendrites, we can make new connections, we can strengthen existing connections, we can grow new neurons. And through this process, we can fundamentally change the brain's capacity to learn and to function. And as I'm getting a little older, it's encouraging uh, that the research suggests this can happen throughout the lifespan. Uh, we have worked with children as young as age five and adults as old as 85. So our brain is designed to be malleable and changeable and we're designed for lifelong learning to flexibly adapt and to meet novel challenges. And when I started my schooling a lot of years ago in the late 1950s, it was a time of what I call the pre-neuroplastic paradigm. The common wisdom at that time was that our brains were fixed, they were hardwired, they were immutable, they were unchangeable. So if there was a problem involving the brain, one was told to accept the challenges and live within the company limitations. And I was basically given that life sentence in grade one, uh, basically told by my teacher that I would never amount to much. Uh, and I didn't accept this limiting belief as I had something not working as it should in my brain, I had severe learning disabilities. So 43 years ago, I set out on a quest to change my brain, to demonstrate that human neuroplasticity was possible. And then when I saw the results, I was committed to taking this work out into the world to benefit others struggling with learning from learning difficulties, to those who had acquired uh, or traumatic brain injury, to those experiencing mild cognitive impairment related to the aging process, and more recently, uh, we're working in regular classrooms to enhance cognitive functions uh, for those that don't who have a deficit but just want to improve performance. Um, so uh, the organization that uh, we work with that then uh, in turn works with clinics, rehabilitation centers, and hospitals around the world to incorporate this work into their settings to benefit those who've experienced acquired or traumatic brain, brain injury is ABI Wellness in Surrey, British Columbia. So I'll talk a bit more about their research and results uh, later in this presentation, but I would encourage people to um, investigate ABI Wellness. So uh, what is this concept of, of neuroplasticity? I mean, today, Everybody knows that our brains are capable of change. And we hear people say on a regular basis that every time we learn something, our brain changes. Well, that is true. These types of changes tend to be temporary, involving mainly short-term synaptic strength and temporary facilitation or in inhibition. And this is not the type of change that I'm speaking about. I'm talking about significant, meaningful, sustained change that impacts cognition, learning, memory, social, emotional well-being, 
and one's ability to fully and competently engage in the broad world, from education to vocation to social relations. These are critical factors that need to be incorporated in, in, into any practice to drive meaningful and significant and sustained change in the brain. And it's important when we think about neuroplasticity that it's really a neutral concept. It can have positive or negative effects. Uh, the brain can change either in a positive way or in a negative direction. And we often think only of the positive outcomes of improved cognitive functioning as a result of stimulation or experience. This is what we call activity dependent plasticity. So the activity drives the plastic change in the brain. And studies investigating the relationship between neuroplasticity and mental health have found negative brain changes for individuals experiencing prolonged anxiety, chronic stress, depression, and sleep deprivation. And in our own lives, we all know the short-term impact on learning of these negative conditions, how they interfere with our focus, concentration, and ability to learn. And research is pointing to the long-term structural and functional changes of these stressors on the brain. So an incredibly important focus in our work and also in our lives needs to be on how do we reduce the negative factors and how do we increase the positive factors leading to positive neuroplastic change. So if you take anything away from what I say today, I think this maybe is one of the most important actionable messages. So it is really important to reduce stress. People who routinely experience chronic stress, and this is really chronic stress, long-term stress, release the hormone cortisol, which uh, run, one researcher said is, is like an acid bath uh, eating away at the hippocampus, which is part of the brain that's engaged in memory. And, and a study demonstrated that adults with a history of long-term chronic stress, and chronic pain is also in this category, had lost up to 25% of the volume of this critically important part of the brain, and we're less able to form new memories. So reduce stress. But the good news is that we can reverse the negative effects of stress on our brain by engaging in activities such as a relaxing walk, gardening, deep breathing, a moment of gratitude, meditation, visualizing a calming scene. When people consciously practice gratitude, there's an increase in the neurotransmitters, norepinephrine and dopamine, leading to an enhancement of mood and increased alertness of focus. So keep a gratitude journal, spend five minutes a day writing or thinking about what you're grateful for in the day. Meditation has been found to lead to positive changes in the brain related to learning, memory, self-regulation, compassion, introspection, and a reduction in anxiety, stress, and depression. The benefits of exercise are profound, and we're going to hear more about this from um, Dr. Quilico's research. We know that sort of the rule of thumb, if it's good for the heart, it's good for the brain. Um, it improves brain health, cognitive functioning, mood. So get out there and move and exercise. So we need to go out and engage in these kinds of these kind of activities, such as exercise, meditation, gratitude, adequate sleep, socializing, that reduce the negative neuroplastic factors. And we need to add the principles that drive neuroplastic change to our daily activities. So what are some of those um, factors that are built into the program that I developed? Um, and we call this either Aerosmith program when we're working with individuals with learning difficulties. The cognitive exercises are called BrainX uh, when we're working with individuals with an acquired brain injury. It's just a, you know, a different name for uh, the, the same program. And the, the intention of these programs is to strengthen and stimulate functioning in a range of critical cognitive domains. So here are the key principles that I kind of sussed out in 1978 and started uh, designing into the, the program. So really you need to create a task that stimulates a specific cognitive area. Um, my work came out of looking at Luria's work, the Russian neuropsychologist who was uh, sort of mapping brain function and then Rosenzweig's work at Berkeley who was looking at active dependent plasticity, stimulation of function uh, with rats. And in one of his articles, he talked about this concept of differential stimulation. He blindfolded the rats, put them in a really enriched environment, and he found the somatosensory cortex was what had changed as a result of that sensory stimulation. So for me, then a light bulb went off that it's not general stimulation, which in general, general stimulation is good for the brain, but if you're going to address a cognitive difficulty or cognitive deficit, you need to target the stimulation to the cognitive function that you're trying to strengthen or improve. 
And then the next hallmark is you have to remove the support of the areas that would compensate. Because traditionally, if we've got an area of weakness, we find a strength to compensate or work around that area of difficulty. This, uh, this work does absolutely the opposite. We remove the compensations because we're trying to differentially stimulate and target that specific cognitive function. And it's impossible to completely do that, but we do that to the best of our ability. And this leads to that concept of effortful processing. If people know Tracy Shore's work out of Rutgers uh, University, she talks a lot about effortful processing. And, and that's really critical. It's, it's where the effortful processing is occurring that's driving the, the activity dependent plasticity. And then you have to start the level of the task difficulty just above the level of current functioning. It's sort of if you imagine going to the gym and you decided after not going to the gym for several years, you're gonna go and lift 400 pounds, you wouldn't be very successful. If you went to lift two pounds, you know, it wouldn't be much of a workout. So the idea is you need to calibrate the level of difficulty just slightly above um, current attainability to again, do the effortful processing. And then you add on complexity once automaticity happens. And then you have to build in performance criteria that is rewarded. So accuracy is built into all of the, the programs. Uh, it's 90% or better because before we increase the stimulation, we wanna make sure that that uh, area is competently holding and functioning at that level. The person has to be able to uh, perform consistently because again, you might be able to do something once, but you need to do it multiple times to ensure that the, the cognitive function is solid at that level. And then it needs to be automatic because I was taking you five minutes to do something that should be taking you two seconds. We have to get you down to the two seconds. And then once all the mastery criteria is, is um, met, we increase the complexity and, and the degree of stimulation. So these are, these are the principles that, uh, you know, that I worked out and intuited all those years ago uh, that are built into all of the work that, that we do. So what is something else that I've learned, oops, I'll go back one, um, is over the past 40 years, is that really coming to understand that we each one of us has our own unique cognitive profile that, that's it's complex. And if we each think about our own learning process, we can all identify areas where we excel, where we can function very, very effectively, and other areas that we tend to avoid. So maybe we don't have a good spatial sense and we get lost, or we don't pick up languages easily, or we miss subtle social cues. And underpinning these abilities is our unique cognitive profile of strengths and areas of challenge. And in most cases, we can work around these challenges as they don't have a significant impact on our lives. But you know, an individual that has a learning difficulty or a learning disability, and I prefer the term difficulty, which we use in the Southern hemisphere, disability we use in the Northern hemisphere, uh, occurs when there's what I call a cognitive load and a significant number of cognitive weaknesses or difficulties come together to make certain aspects of learning challenging and to make the ability to compensate very difficult. And I've learned that there's explanatory value in looking at behavior through a cognitive lens, that understanding an individual's unique profile can provide insight into and explain behavior. So some examples, think of those individuals that you know who are unable to benefit from insight due to a cognitive issue. They can't connect cause and effect and as such can't develop insight into their behavior. And in these cases, this is not due to psychological reasons such as resistance, but a cognitive challenge that prevents them from having this type of understanding. Or we can think of people that we view as stubborn or rigid. And this may be due to a cognitive difficulty in not being able to see and consider an alternative way of viewing a situation. I had this challenge and starting in grade one, all the way through my schooling was labeled as rigid and stubborn. And it came from a cognitive place, not an emotional place. And someone who doesn't follow instructions may not be defiant, but they may have an auditory memory problem and can't retain what they've been asked to do. If people are interested, there's a questionnaire, a cognitive profile questionnaire on the website that you can go on, answer it for yourself, answer it for your child. And based on your answers, it will uh, produce your cognitive profile of the 19 uh, cognitive areas that we can currently work with. And I've learned how unique and complex are our individual learning profiles. A researcher a couple of years ago at the University of Toronto analyzed the learning profiles of over 1400 students who completed the Aerosmith assessment. And he found that 70% of the students had a unique profile shared with no other student. 
So then if we think about addressing learning difficulties, it's really important to understand that complexity and that there is no one size fits all. So if we want to investigate some of these uh, cognitive functions, these apply to all of us as we, as I mentioned, we each have our own cognitive um, profile. And I define a cognitive function as the job of a region of the brain or a network of regions critical to specific aspects of learning. And cognitive functioning works on a continuum. So someone can be gifted in the area, they can have an average functioning or have a mild, moderate or severe level of challenge. And each one of these can be at different levels in the same person. And the strengths and weaknesses of these cognitive functions contribute to each individual's unique learning profile. So what are some of these functions? Uh, the capacity to read nonverbal cues, which is critical for navigating social interactions. I think we can all recognize a person who's awkward socially, who can't learn from feedback in social situations. It may be due to a problem in this area. The visual memory functions necessary for learning to read and spell. Think of the person who spells the same word multiple ways on the same page. To executive functions, which are critical for thinking, problem solving, planning. And I describe this in my book as hitting the wall. Think of the person that can't generate solutions to a problem, so they're constantly getting stuck in their problems. The capacity for recognizing faces. The ability to learn motor plans necessary for writing. Think of the individual who can tell a beautiful story, but you put a pen in his or her hand and almost nothing ends up on the page. To auditory memory functions involved in retaining information. Think of the person who has to scribble notes everywhere in order to remember what they need to do, or the person who goes to the store after being asked to buy five items but comes home with only three, or the person who doesn't like to listen to books on tape because they don't retain information through listening, or the student that comes home and knows they have homework but really has no ideas to the details. To understanding number and quantity required for time scheduling and budgeting. We probably all know people who are always running late or run out of money because they can't budget or run out of gas on the highway because they can't estimate how far they can go on a tank of gas. To the capacity for grasping relationships necessary for comprehension. This was one of my critical challenges and led to pretty much a complete lack of understanding of my world. To reasoning spatially in order to navigate. And this is the person who frequently gets lost, who can't read a map and takes extra time to get anywhere. They also would struggle playing any kind of spatial games like checkers. And I encourage you, if you're interested again, to try that cognitive questionnaire because it'll give you a snapshot of your, your cognitive profile. And I've learned that there's no part of the brain that's unimportant. Each part contributes to some aspect of our functioning in the world. We don't just use 10% of our brains, which we hear people saying at times, over the course of the day, I guarantee you, you use all aspects of your brain. And if there's an area of difficulty, it will show itself. At Aerosmith, we've worked with lots of adults whose cognitive profile isn't compatible with their jobs, what I call a cognitive mismatch. And I think sometimes this goes into what we call human error. I worked with a pilot who had that auditory memory problem and he couldn't remember the instructions from the air traffic controller, which I thought was a little worrisome. Um, I mean, he had a strategy to get the air traffic controller to repeat the uh, instructions you know, over and over again. But my worry was what if he's flying into a really busy airspace and the air traffic controller doesn't have that time. So the solution was we worked on his auditory memory and now he can hold that information. Another example was a butcher that I worked with that had the kinesthetic problem. So his job was hold a sharp knife in your right hand to cut things and not know where your left hand is in space. So the first day I met him, his left hand was all wrapped up in bandages because he was cutting himself accidentally. Um, we address that problem and he no longer cuts himself. So I, I think, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, your dentist, you want your dentist to have really good spatial ability so that they can map, you know, to the right tooth from the x-ray when they drill. Um, so if people are interested in my, my book, I have lots of examples of these, what I call these cognitive um, mismatches. And for people that are interested in research, there are a number of research studies that have been done on, on this work uh, and continuing. In fact, I was just talking to the researcher this morning from Southern Illinois University. We're doing a big study, a worldwide study uh, on our cognitive intensive program this summer using uh, some measures from uh, Cambridge, from the Cambridge Brain Sciences. So really excited about that. Uh, we are committed to doing ongoing research. And what are we seeing in the brains of individuals as they work on the cognitive programs? So the, the next little bit will be on individuals with learning difficulties. 
here are the networks that the research is investigating, um, default mode, dorsal attention, salience, and frontal parietal. And we're seeing changes uh, in the connectivity within and between these networks. And why are these changes important? And we're seeing these changes in the students that are in our six to eight week program and in our 10 month academic year program. And these networks are involved in a number of critical cognitive processes necessary for learning. So attention is one of these. Uh, these networks are critical for regulating and directing one's focus of attention. Problems here are implicated in, in ADHD. Uh, they're involved in thinking, planning, problem solving, making decisions, what we think of executive functions. Uh, they're critical in working memory, so the ability to hold and manipulate information in our mind, enable, which enables us to uh, perform tasks. Cognitive control, which are processes that actively maintain behavior in service of achieving goals. Comprehension, memory, the ability to take the perspective of another, uh, of another which is really critical for empathy self-awareness through the integration of sensory, emotional, and cognitive information, using past experiences to plan for the future, efficiency of processing, mental initiative. I love it when a student summarizes all the research up in one sentence. And this was a, um, a young adult who came for a, a year. He finished university, but he was drifting. His parents were in despair. Uh, he had executive functioning difficulties at a mild level. But what he said is this improved. He said, I began to organize my thoughts more effectively and to plan ahead. First, a few weeks ahead, then a few months ahead. For the first time in my life, I had real long-term goals and was able to take the steps towards achieving them. This student decided to go back to uh, university. He finished a four-year design degree and he came second in the world for his racing car design. So pretty good executive functioning after this. So more activation in these networks is beneficial to all aspects of learning. And then, so it's great we're seeing changes in the brain, but how do they show up in the real world? So these are uh, three studies done at three different universities, two in Canada, one in the United States looking at uh, cognitive domains on the Woodcock-Johnson standardized assessment. So these are really critical cognitive domains for the individual's ability to understand, to reason, to process information automatically, quickly, accurately, to retain information, to sustain attention necessary for problem solving, all essential cognitive capacities required for learning through life. And these are all changing significantly across this research as students uh, go through this, uh, this program. And then because we deal with a lot of uh, students that are in school, how do these changes translate into academic learning? So research has shown that the rate of learning accelerates. Students are able to acquire academic skills more quickly and there are improvements on academic measures. And again, this is the Woodcock Johnson using their standardized uh, academic uh, uh, tests. So things like word recognition, reading speed, comprehension, a number of math abilities from computation to quantitative concepts, which is math reasoning, uh, written expression, receptive language, all of these areas are changing. Uh, at a significant level. So the conclusion, cognitive capacity change leads to academic growth. And one teacher implementing this program in South Carolina in a grade two class said, there's something about Aerosmith that makes students excited to try something new. I would reframe that a little bit and say it gives the students the cognitive resources to be successful when they try something new. And what about social emotional well being? Um, this is research at, at UBC. There were two different studies looking at uh, social emotional outcomes. Uh, and they concluded that students over the course of one year in Aerosmith reported a greater sense of well being and happiness at the end of the year. They developed uh, this more open mindset using Carol Dweck's uh, measures. Uh, they had an increased sense of locus of control. They saw themselves as agents of change in their lives. I mean, you can't really be in a program that's driving neuroplastic change in your brain and have a closed mindset or not feel like you have locus of control. They developed an increase um, uh, in their social and leadership skills, a greater ability to focus and attend, reduction in anxiety and depression, and a positive trend in the reduction of the stress hormone cortisol because they took uh, measures of cortisol. The students liked that part of the study because they got to spit at the beginning of the study and spit at the end of the study. Um, so, you know, in summary, what is Aerosmith? Um, it's, it's a targeted cognitive program using differential stimulation and effort for processing, leading to structural and functional changes in the brain, which leads to increase in cognitive capacity and the ability to learn, which then flows out to increased social emotional well-being and increased academic and career 
success. You know, our underlying premise, change the brain, change cognitive capacity, change academic outcomes, change social emotional well-being, and fundamentally transform the future of the learner. And then what are we seeing uh, in individuals with an acquired brain injury? And this is work uh, being done uh, by the group out in Surrey, BC by ABI Wellness. So again, I would encourage you to look at their website. All of the research is there. It's also on our website, um, but there, there are multiple studies that have been done. And interesting, the research is uncovering a similar pattern in the students with learning difficulties and students with acquired brain injury. They're seeing a pattern of underconnectivity and hyperconnectivity prior to intervention in the brain of these individuals. And the hypothesis is that the hyperconnectivity is compens a compensatory strategy to account for a loss of structural connectivity due to the injury, or in the case of a learning difficulty, due to the learning difficulty. And it is argued that this comes at a cost of slowed processing speed, impaired cognitive function, and cognitive fatigue. So what is the, what outcomes are flowing out of the work as they're working as these individuals with acquired or traumatic brain injury are working through the cognitive program. Um, we're seeing structural and functional changes in the brain. They're seeing an improvement in functional network connectivity in bilateral frontal regions involved in the executive control network. So very important. Uh, they're seeing a statistically significant increase in functional connectivity in other networks that had shown reduced connectivity at baseline. In terms of neuropsychological and cognitive domains, they saw at baseline, these individuals perform less well than controls on standardized tests of cognitive abilities, specifically fluid cognition, verbal learning, and memory. And after three months of cognitive intervention, there was significant improvement in performance on all three of these cognitive domains. Uh, improvements were also noted in organization, self-direction, social awareness, communication, and executive functioning. And they looked at social emotional changes and they found a reduction in anxiety and depression for these individuals. And then uh, this is the, the quality of life outcome uh, scale. Uh, it's a measurement developed by, I'll get his name wrong, Dr. David Tulksky uh, of the University of Delaware to measure quality of life for individuals who've experienced a traumatic brain injury. And the, this was done by ABI Wellness as individuals with traumatic and acquired brain injury moved through the, the cognitive or through their program. Uh, and they found um, significant improvement uh, on emotional health. And this looks at positive affect, well being, depression, anxiety, self esteem, emotional and behavioral uh, control. So, all of that improved. Uh, cognition, which they look at executive functioning, communication, comprehension, significantly improved. Social participation, which they measured the ability to par participate in social roles and activities, and the satisfaction with those social roles and activities, and independence. And that improved at a statistically significant level. And then the global scale globally looks at the, the average of all the scales. So really significant improvements in quality of life, which is really important for individuals with acquired and traumatic brain injury uh, as they work through the program. And then uh, another um, part of the study that they did at ABI Wellness was looking at return to work data. And the return to work statistics indicate that around 40% of individuals who completed rehabilitation return to work. Uh, for individuals who completed the ABI wellness program, the return to work was at 77%. And again, all of this research uh, is on the ABI wellness website, and I would encourage people to uh, look at it. And the researchers at UBC concluded, our results provide evidence that participating in an intensive cognitive intervention program was associated with neuroplastic changes in adults with chronic TBI that occurred in parallel with improvements in cognition. Overall, we observed a shift from a baseline pattern of network organization characterized by neural inefficiency and decreased cognition to a reorganization that reflected improved efficiency with improvements in fluid cognition, verbal learning, and memory. Importantly, this data suggests that brain network organization is capable of reorganization, even in chronic patients with intense intervention. So given that our brain mediates our relationship with ourselves, others in our world, the power of a neuroplastic program driving cognitive change is that it improves broad aspects of an ind individual's quality of life. And I just want to leave you with the human face of this work, as to me, this is the why. It's always the human face of why certainly I engage in this work, which is the human transformation. 
So this was an individual, I met him uh, a few years ago when I was out at ABI Wellness. Uh, so Rand Weber, that's his name, uh, he's given us me permission to uh, talk about him. Uh, his profile in October of 2016 looked like this. He was a popular elementary school teacher living in Vancouver, 58 years old, but not thinking about retirement, a fit former marathoner. But in the middle of that month, while driving to the gym, his car was hit at high speed by a driver of a stolen car and his profile changed dramatically. Just days after the accident, Rand barely got through a parent-teacher conference being unable to focus. He couldn't follow a conversation or process the information in the discussion. Rand took a leave of absence for the rest of the school year as he could not carry out the tasks that had been second nature to him before. While off work, Rand discovered the work of ABI Wellness and he enrolled. He said, after my injury and before this work, I had no lateral thinking. If I veered off a topic or got distracted, I get lost. I wouldn't know where to start again. Something as simple as a parent-teacher conference I couldn't handle. I couldn't multitask an essential skill when working with a classroom of elementary age students. And his comments at the end of his program, which enabled him to return to work full time as a teacher, he said, the difference is incredible. I saw a huge spike in my ability to focus and to multi multitask. And my days at school are very productive. Now I'm able to switch from one activity to another, from programming the smart board, to talking to the kids, to writing at my desk, to moving through the classroom and helping students at their desk. I couldn't do that before, and I wasn't able to teach at a level that was doing anybody any good. And Rand's story is the human face of these brain behavior changes. And I asked Rand, I said, are you a different teacher as a result of your experience? And he said, yes, I am. I'm so much more patient and understanding, especially with those students who have learning difficulties. And the comment from his students in his grade three classroom, I thought was really quite adorable. They were kept abreast of the things while he was away. He said, Mr. Weber is at brain camp. So we can change our brain, we can change cognitive capacity, we can change the capacity to learn, we can change social emotional well being, and change one's ability to engage in meaningful work and transform one's reality. And just to come back from where, to where this work started from, and this is just the end. Um, I mean, I started in education, I started I was my my first experimental subject. Um, and this is my vision. And I, I do dream of a day when cognitive transformation just becomes a normal part of the journey of education. We go to school to learn. We learn with our brain. Let's put our brain into the education equation. So um, I thank people for listening. Uh, here's the link to ABI Wellness. Here's some, some books, some links to some research study if people are interested. And every month I do, uh, I'm on a virtual world tour given that we can't really travel anywhere. So I'd welcome anybody that wants to join me on my virtual world tour. I talk a lot more about the research um, and I have people joining me from all around the world that are part of this work. So you don't just have to hear from me, you can hear from them. So again, um, thank you. Thanks, Barbara, for such uh, an incredibly informal, informative uh, presentation. Uh, you're truly a pioneer in neuroplasticity. Um, some of the things that you said really resonated with me. Uh, I remember even 10 years ago when I suffered my brain injury in my accident, um, the, the common thought was still that, you know, the brain is a fixed organ, it doesn't heal. So I want to thank you for all of your work in shedding lights around neuroplasticity and, you know, you're a true visionary. Uh, I would also like to thank Pace Law for sponsoring Barbara's talk, and um, I would like to give a warm thank you to Obaya. We're so happy to be partnering with such an amazing organization such as yourselves. Um, to introduce myself, uh, for those who don't know, I'm Dr. Matthew Galati. Um, I myself am a TBI survivor. And I started the Brain Changes Initiative back in 2019, and it was largely inspired around my own recovery. Uh, and rehabilitation. Um, and the, miss the mission of Brain Changes is to help push and change the standard of care for traumatic brain injury survivors um, through research, but also through education. So we strive to provide education, awareness, and support for TBI patients, their families, um, uh, healthcare providers, and even people who just want to live a brain healthy lifestyle. Uh, so on that note, I would like to open the floor up to some questions here for you, Barbara. Mm -hmm. 
So first question, can you please give an example of effortless processing? Um, it, it just really means, like, if I take the analogy down to physical, because it's often easier to understand. So uh, let's say you can easily lift 10 pounds. That's probably about where I am. And 15 pounds, you could probably attain, but it would be a stretch and 20 would be impossible. You go for the 15, like it is effort for processing means you're just pushing yourself a little bit beyond um, what is currently attainable with your current capacity. Like what, what's easy? Like what, basically whenever you're on cruise control, you're not driving neuroplastic change in the brain. And I'm saying there's cruise control is great. Like there are lots of times when it's good to be on cruise control, but if you want to drive neuroplastic change, you, you have to, increase the, the complexity and the level of difficulty of what you're doing slightly beyond what's attainable. And that leads to that effort for processing. It, it takes effort to, to process whatever it is that, that you're, you're doing. It can't be too much, or then the brain's kind of spinning gears. It's not engaging, right? So it's, it's kind of that sweet spot of calibrating the level of difficulty slightly beyond what's currently attainable, but within reach. Gotcha. Thank you for that. Um, second question, has the cognitive profile been applied in employment screening? Have there been challenges in its administration? Um, it's a really interesting question. We use it in my company, uh, which is, um, I mean, I, I don't insist everybody does it, but anybody that wants to do it. And, and it is really helpful, um, I believe, and I did a presentation a couple of weeks ago to a group in Europe that's looking at, at doing that. Because if we, if we think about collaboration in teams, um, you know, we think maybe we're one big neural network, right, in, in a team. And we know that we all have, you know, areas where we excel and areas where we're not uh, as proficient. And so if we can understand each other's cognitive profile, not in a way to belittle or stigmatize, but say, hey, you know, I'm not really great at this auditory memory piece. So, um, you know, have somebody else that's good at, at that. So we haven't done it extensively, but it's something that really intrigues me. And we found it really valuable in our organization, um, partly to, uh, you know, support the individual. Um, also, one of the benefits of working for my organization is anybody, any of the, the staff can do the cognitive work. So if we do identify something that, that is an area of challenge and the person wants to work on that, they have that as an opportunity as well. But I, I think, I truly think there's benefit in understanding one's cognitive profile, no matter whether it's in, even in relationships, like in marriages, you know, it's, it's made a difference at times. Um, just an, an example of this couple that the, husband is gifted spatially, like gifted, like almost he could probably be a racing car driver. Um, and his wife isn't. And so she's terrified every time she's in the car because he sees openings, kind of like Wayne Gretzky, right? He sees openings in traffic that she can't see. So th she thinks he's reckless, but no, he's just exceptional at that capacity. Um, so yeah, I think there's lots of value in, in our all understanding our, our cognitive profile. Um, and th this is a really interesting question. Do you account for sex and gender differences in the research? Uh, and has there been any differences? Yeah, it, it's, it, that's a really interesting question. I, I can't um, answer it very well. I mean, there's certainly lots of research. There was research suggesting there was, then there was research now suggesting that there isn't. Um, and I probably, I haven't really investigated it. I mean, I think I've seen, um, and again, it, it's, it's kind of, generalizations where women tend to be a bit better in what I call object recognition, kind of like the, the visual details of things uh, and men may be a little better spatially and maybe it makes sense in terms of evolution that there were, you know, if, if we think about activity dependent plasticity, you know, our brain changed in response to demands in our environment. So if, if there were, a certain points, significantly different roles, maybe certain capacities developed uh, along gender lines, but that's not really the case today. So it's an interesting question and I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, okay, and last question, is there a cost to the cognitive profile questionnaire? No, it's, it's, uh, it's free. Okay, thank you, Barbara. Uh, so 
I will uh, hand this over to Lauren. Are you taking over? Okay. And please, if everybody can follow us at Brain Changes on Instagram, we have a lot of great information. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Lauren Huff, and I am the Community Outreach and Assistance the Executive Director for the Ontario Brain Injury Association. And I really just want to thank Barbara Aerosmith Young for her presentation. It was incredible and so interesting. And there's a lot of amazing comments in the chat that I hope you're able to read. Um, I would now like to ask our sponsors, Celeste Thurwell from Health Wellness Industries, to introduce our next speaker, Enrico Quilico, whose story is truly inspirational. Thank you, Lauren. And again, thank you to Obaya and Brain Changes Initiative. And I've been waiting to meet Barbara for years. Uh, so we finally got to, to meet remotely, which was wonderful. My son had attended her, his, her program in Toronto and, and benefited very greatly. I think the best thing is that the neuroplastic system is plastic. And, I, and I'm, we're talking about it at Health and Wellness Industries as as we heal, it's like taking your brain to the gym. You know, if you go to the gym every day, you'll see results and you try different machines and different workouts. The same thing with healing the brain from trauma. And we've heard some of this information from Barbara this morning. And now the next person is Enrico. And I wanted to introduce him to you. He is a doctoral candidate who runs a community-based physical activity program for adults with moderate to severe traumatic brain injury that is supported by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. He graduated from Concordia University and then went on to do his graduate work at McGill University where he began his research program into adapted physical activity. He has been featured as a 2020 Global Hero, a winner of the 2019 SSHRC Storyteller Competition, and was also nominated in 2018 as a Change Maker Award by the Neurological Health and Charities Canada. So we welcome Enrico and I look forward to hearing about his program. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. It's really an honor to be here with everybody and I'm coming to you directly from Montreal and you can see University of Montreal behind me, where I have the fortune of working with a uh, with the Center for Interdisciplinary Research and Rehabilitation of Greater Montreal. So although I am indeed a student at University of Toronto, um, and that's where I'm, I'm completing my PhD. I, I am co-supervised by, by another uh, professor at the University of Montreal in the School of Rehabilitation. So I have the fortune of working with two incredible scholars named Dr. Angela Colantonio and Dr. Bonnie Swain. So what I'll do now is I'm gonna share my screen and begin my presentation. Okay, again, it is truly an honor to be here with you today. And certainly to be part of um, this initiative, uh, which I, I fully support. Today in the presentation, I'm gonna be speaking with you about my personal experience with brain injury um, and recovery. I'm going to speak to you more broadly about the biopsychosocial benefits of exercise after traumatic brain injury. I'm going to speak to you about best practice methods to promote exercise after brain injury. And then I'm very much looking forward to the question answer period afterwards, because that's the part I enjoy the most. In that Global Hero article, which I was fortunate enough to be part of right at the end of 2020, um, they, they asked me a question when I was interviewed about, about my take home message or what I'd like to share um, if I just had to say it in, in one phrase. And um, I thought it'd be a good opportunity to kick this off at the beginning of the presentation and I'm gonna circle back to it towards the end. So maybe just something that can resonate with you throughout the presentation as I speak and, and share with you um, these different uh, He's speaking about these different topics. So despite the most difficult challenges that we are faced with in life, 
we can always strive to overcome them and great happiness can be found in that process. On May 21st, 2006, um, so in a week, it'll be 15 years. I was driving a motorcycle on the highway and I was cut off by a car. And um, well, in fact, the car crossed the highway in front of me and I had to brake very quickly and uh, I lost control of the motorcycle. And I, I landed on my left side, I proceeded to skid for 60 feet. And then I, I hit the car, the back of the car head first. This was just awful. What a horrific scene. Um, I suffered numerous injuries, uh, broke my pelvis, my ribs, shattered my, my humerus, um, my, my elbow. And obviously the worst injury was the severe traumatic brain injury that I sustained as a result of hitting that car um, at that speed. And then uh, hitting the car on the ground. And, you know, it's, it's, it's common with these kinds of injuries that there are, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of the word in French, coup et contre coup. And it's like, um, the, the, it results in multiple lesions in your brain. And, and my brain was swelling um, to um, a, a degree that was very dangerous. So one of the first things that had to be done, obviously, was a craniotomy. And, and that's why I have this, this lovely scar in my head, which I'm able to now cover with my hair. Um, there you see a picture of the motorcycle that I was driving when the accident um, occurred. Uh, and then right beside it is a picture of me in a coma because I, I remained in coma for 13 days after the accident. And, um, and then I, I stayed in the ICU for a month total before I was transferred to another wing of the hospital, the head injury um, wing on the 14th floor. And I stayed in the Montreal General for um, that, that two and a half month period of time before I was transferred out to inpatient rehab. There you have a picture of the beautiful metal plates that are in my, uh, that were surgically inserted in my, uh, in my arm. And, uh, and I was very uh, happy to find out that I did not ring at airports when I, when I traveled afterwards, uh, which was, which was uh, a nice surprise. So like I said, I had um, the experience to, uh, or I was a patient at the Montreal General, which is a photo beside me. He's like right to the right of me here um, for just over two months. And then I was transferred as an inpatient to the Montreal Rehab Institute where I remained for another month and um, or two. And then, and at that center is where I started making um, just groundbreaking progress. And um, I was working with a team of, of rehab professionals um, for ed every single aspect of, of my functioning. Um, ranging from getting up in the morning to dressing myself to, you know, being able to speak properly again to learning how to hold my balance and walk again. And, um, you know, certainly the, the large uh, amount of focus and, and the most important thing were, were related to the cognitive um, activities that, that um, I, I now had to work on in order to, to become more functional. And, and that continued for two years after the accident. And that last picture there at Constance Lethbridge is an outpatient rehab center where I continued on, um, like I said, up until uh, the end of 2008. So this recovery process was extremely long. Um, although I would argue that it, that the recovery after traumatic brain injury far exceeds that first two year process or period. Um, and I say that because the transition out of a clinical setting and into the community is extremely challenging after, um, after severe TBI. Um, as you can see, I had lost a tremendous amount of weight as a result of lying in a hospital bed for months. Um, I, I believe I lost somewhere around 60, 70 pounds. And you can see um, I'm, I'm like a string, a string. <laughs> and I, I had this, I had this, um, this missing piece of, of my skull because they had done a craniotomy to allow, you know, my my brain the room it, it required to swell, and um, 
but then, like I said, you know, I was fortunate enough to grow my hair back and uh, and cover it up. And they, they put that same piece, that same piece of bone that, that they removed back in um, several months later. And um, and one of the first things I did before uh, going back to school was I started um, training at a YMCA and, and I, I didn't have a very, you know, the, the future was uncertain because there were no guarantees about how far I was going to recover and how much I was going to be able to reclaim a functional life. So the purpose of or beyond just me really uh, appreciating um, exercise, which was new to me, very new to me after the, uh, before the injury, I, I was very sedentary. So um, it was really in that Montreal Rehab Institute where I started being involved with physiotherapy. And I can remember uh, exactly the moment when, when I was just so inspired by these photos of, of uh, athletes with disabilities across the walls. And, and, and that's the moment that I had decided, that's when I decided that I wanted to make this event in my life, this terrible, tragic event in my life, something something better, an opportunity for me to change for the better. And, and exercise, along with education, but certainly exercise became to some degree the vehicle with which I was able to make these tremendous leaps and, 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 and bounce when it came to improvements. Um, so uh, long story short, I, I started, I became a fitness trainer, I became a personal trainer and I went back to school. And, and the fitness training industry was my plan B if, if I wasn't able to get, get through my studies because I was going back with, with disabilities, with memory and focus and concentration and certainly processing speed, okay, that were new found. I, I, I never had these difficulties before. And, and I took a lot of things for granted and, and those things were taken from me in an instant. And I learned that I had to work 10 times harder to, to regain um, those capacities. And so you, you can understand that this is also one of the most humbling experiences of my life. And as I mentioned along the way, the most positive or one of the most positive aspects of my long-term recovery was my excessive involvement in cardiorespiratory endurance exercise. I decided two years after the accident that I wanted to do a triathlon to celebrate that I was still alive and show the world and myself that I could still do this. I could still function in society. And, and lo and behold, that, that first race became, I got bit by the bug and I, and I became so passionate about endurance sports. I started competing every season. I was in master swimming Canada. I started running and doing this like short distance races and then and, and, and doing triathlons over and over again, year after year after year. And it has literally become the, the it is such a huge part of my life. It's just unbelievable. And I keep up to this day, okay? My first triathlon was in 2008. By 2011, I was running half marathons and I did my first half Ironman. And by 2016, 10 years after my accident, I did my first full Ironman in Lake Placid, New York. And it was such a great occasion because I raised over $10,000 for Brain Injury Canada in the process of, of, of participating in this, in this tremendous event. You can see just a couple photos of me here, master swimming, running a marathon, doing triathlons and, and crossing that Ironman finish line. So I would say that the second most positive aspect of my long-term recovery was returning to school. And as I mentioned, this was incredibly difficult because I returned to school with newfound disabilities that I had to work around and learn new ways of, of, of making ends meet. So going back to school and doing a four-year Bachelor of Education was actually quite beneficial because it was almost as though while learning how to become a pedagogue that in along the process, I was teaching myself how to, how to relearn again. And I didn't feel like I was done by the time the Bachelor of Education was finished. So I decided to pursue a master's degree in kinesiology and physical education. And that's when I started getting involved with adaptive physical activity. And that's when I started getting supported by, by you know, mentors 
who, who recognize the passion I have for this research. And, and that's what has taken me along this incredible journey. And so, and so, now I'm gonna transition and speak to you a little more formally about some of the benefits of exercise after traumatic brain injury. And around that time in 2012, when I began my master's degree, this was the latest research at the time. And you can just imagine how excited I was to find out that cardiorespiratory exercise was being recommended for the alleviation of TBI related sequelae. And that it had to do with the upregulation of these proteins like brain derived neurotrophic factor in the brain that are allowing people to develop their neuroplasticity and and, and it also has this protective effect with like anti-apoptosis and, and you know, that you're preserving your, your brain health at the same time. And there was literature that supported the cognitive benefits of exercise after TBI, but I would argue that it certainly wasn't where it is today. And we know a lot more now about how beneficial exercise can be. I mean, just take, for example, concussion research, which I have a colleague who, uh, who um, is involved with um, and, and, and takes a look at the timing in which, uh, in which exercise um, is, is, is beneficial for recovery after brain injury. And so from mild brain injury, from concussions to moderate to severe um, traumatic brain injury, I would argue that the consensus is that once restorative processes in the brain have been or, or have finished. And with regard to moderate to severe TBI, we're talking about perhaps an extended period of time. But at that time, then exercise starts becoming beneficial and can improve cognitive functioning uh, for individuals with TBI, um, especially in the chronic phases. Okay. So this is, is leading up to the reasoning and the incentives and the purpose for the research that I started getting involved with in my master's in adaptive physical activity. Um, exercise is also shown to alleviate depression after TBI and increase mood, positive mood states. No big surprise there. It's, it's positive for the entire population to exercise. Um, it, it also happened to be the preferred method of treating depression um, as, as evidenced by people living with TBI themselves. Okay. And it was consistently shown to this day to reduce depressive symptoms after TBI. So tremendous benefits with regard to, to, um, to depression, which is a major problem after TBI. I mean, we're talking about probably the most prevalent psychiatric disorder following TBI. I mean, the, the statistics are just staggering. Something like 45% um, of, of individuals uh, with, will experience major depressive disorder within the first 2.5 years of their injury, regardless of severity from concussion to moderate to, to severe traumatic brain injury. So this is, this is a big deal. And now we move a little bit more into the adaptive physical activity um, research, which is looking at, because you're following the, the, the reasoning that I'm, the logic that I'm proposing here that I'm presenting to you is that we all know exercise is good for us. It's especially good for people who have had traumatic brain injuries, but it's also good for the entire population. But actually undertaking exercise on a regular basis and, and maintaining positive exercise behaviors is another situation altogether. And, and Driver really led the, the, the research related to, to exploring the barriers um, and uh, that people experience um, to physical activity after recently facing a traumatic brain injury and also explored those subjective experiences. So despite the fact that we know that exercise is good, um, there are certainly an elevated number of barriers for individuals um, to participate in exercise and physical activity after their injuries. But there wasn't any, there wasn't any research about, about looking at those 
physical activity experiences in the community. So Annalise and colleagues came in. That's what the Ponsford, the Jenny Ponsford group in, uh, in Australia came in and, 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 and led a very interesting study. And, and then I was able to contribute to this body with my master's research, which um, interpreted the ways in which adults were, were perceiving their community exercise up to five to 31 years after the severe traumatic brain injuries and from a very in-depth perspective. So now I'd like to transition a little bit away from PA experiences and speak to you about PA programs, because I can tell you um, that one of the most exciting findings that came from that master's research that I led um, with people who had had severe traumatic brain injuries was a need for more support, more community support, uh, more exercise support in the community. And this idea has been tested before. You've got individuals like Divine and colleagues who have um, tested the feasibility of running physical activity exercise programs out of YMCAs in the community with people with moderate to severe TBI. You've got, again, the driver group who's, who's partnering with people who have had traumatic brain injuries in order to adapt health promotion programs, adapting a diabetes health promotion program, and then running the program with people and, and, and showing that it can demonstrate high adherence and significant changes in weight. So health changes for people with TBI. And this is what really led to my, my, the incentive for developing my PhD project, which revolves around the co-creation, implementation, and evaluation of a community-based peer-run physical activity program to enhance exercise and sport participation for adults with moderate to severe TBI. And I have a fortune of working with those people listed below. In this project or this study, this PhD that is supported by the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada um, and Sports Canada, and just, just an incredible, incredible opportunity, which I feel so honored to be a part of. And so this PhD revolves around a program that I began in 2017, a pilot project in partnership with the Quebec TBI Association and the YMCA's of Quebec and 12 participants who had all had moderate to severe TBIs, okay? And we launched that program in 2017. And then we launched the program again in 2018 with another 12 participants. And then we launched that program again in 2019 with 20 participants, okay? And, and what we were able to do with that first pilot uh, program in 2017 was really secure the funding we needed um, to, to continue supporting this, this program of research. And by 2018, my first study involved a, an exploration of that program to determine what was going on, what kind of impacts were happening, why was it so successful? And then in 2019 with the larger group, and this is the second study of my, of my PhD, in partnership with all of these participants and four peer mentors who were involved with the program, running the program, and, and they, we co-created a formal version of this program that can be replicated in other places and, and tested. Um, and so you can just imagine how exciting this all is. And this is a picture of the four peer mentors that were involved with me over the 2019 cohort who contributed tremendously to the project. And over the years, okay, this mentorship component, okay, and these individuals were onboarded as volunteers at the downtown YMCA who ran the program, okay, became a significant part of the program. A program that took a progressive multi-phase approach to learning about how to exercise safely and efficiently. And then learning the skills needed to become an independent exercise, a exerciser and, 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 and develop more autonomy with their own exercises, okay, or exercise behaviors. And then finally to take ownership of this process and extend beyond the walls of the YMCA and, and, and train and participate in sport challenges. And this is very much related to 
to the Sport Canada aspect of this of this initiative because it goes beyond just exercising on a treadmill. There's a whole learning component to this this program that it burns, involves learning the building blocks about how to become an exerciser, an independent autonomous exerciser, and then to go and compete in sport challenges in the community or in the YMCA. And the strategies involved in this program that I would argue make it a, a, as successful as it is, have a lot to do with the behavior change strategies that are involved and taking a focus on the kinds of capabilities and opportunities and motivation that is required for individuals to continue participating in this positive physical activity day after day after day. And taking an interpersonal approach to the delivery of those behavior change strategies, okay, that assures that people feel competent, that they feel relatedness with others while they're doing those activities, and that they feel autonomous when they're doing, when they're making and taking their own decision to be involved. That ownership is a huge aspect to the program. And I'm sure that at this point, you can also appreciate how integral the mentors are to the functioning of this program. Because it's not my program, it's our program. It belongs to every single member as much as it does to, to another, okay? And that's the beauty of this project. That's why it's participatory in nature and, and, and it's making a difference in people's lives. It always has the underlying goal of supporting those positive PA behaviors. And year after year, it has been nothing but a success. In 2017, at the end of the 12 month program, okay, our participants were involved in teams and they all participated in an indoor triathlon at the downtown YMCA. Okay, even, even getting some medals and exceeding everyone's expectations. Then in 2018, they took it to another level in their teams once again. And I am telling you, there is still to this day in the downtown YMCA Montreal, a trophy with the names of the participants from our program who, who secured the first and the second and like gold and silver medals in this indoor triathlon. It was just tremendous. And what a beautiful inclusive event to witness with, with my own eyes and see people from the community participating and competing in this event alongside people with disabilities. The most beautiful inclusive event that I have ever seen in my life. I, I kid you not. And then in 2019, oh my God, it went beyond the downtown YMCA and our participants were involved with an outdoor five kilometer Mount Royal Marathon race. And once again, exceeded everyone's expectations and blew everybody away. Time and time again, they exceeded, the participants exceeded everyone's expectations. And it was a growing success year after year until, and we were supposed to run the 2020 cohort with 30 participants, okay? 30 participants, 30 approved participants. And unfortunately the pandemic happened and that downtown YMCA that was supporting our program for all those years has not reopened and will not be reopening this year due to the financial constraints that have been imposed on the organization due to, due to the pandemic. But that's not to say that there are still, there aren't possibilities for the future because I am working very, very hard on exactly that. And I'm excited to share with you in the future what will be coming, okay? But I'm not going to go into too much more detail than that because I want to come back, to circle back and, and, and ask you, now that I have shared my personal story and ongoing life's work, okay, can you see how fortunate I am to have changed my long-term outcome with both education and certainly exercise? To this day, I have not stopped. I'm still a student and I still compete in triathlons every season. 
Okay. I went cycling this morning at the crack of dawn and did a 40K before I started my day. This is part of my life now. And I also hope you understand why I'm so committed to sharing this with others and supporting similar initiatives like the Brain Changes Movement. So once again, despite the most difficult challenges that we are faced with in life, we can always strive to overcome them and great happiness can be found in the process. I think that everyone experiences great challenges in life. And I also believe sincerely that we all have the choice of how we choose to face those challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you for your attention. I really want to thank Brain Changes and Obaya, Ontario Brain Injury Association. I support brain games and exercise participation after TBI. I invite everyone to check out Brain Changes on their Instagram page and please join the larger movement for all the good that it can bring. And now my favorite part is the question period. Thanks so much, Enrico. Uh, honestly, your story almost brought tears to my eyes because it just reminds me so much of my own. Uh, I don't know what's the fact um, of, you know, we were both 23 or we both had wicked long hair. Um, but we both had a very severe brain injury. Uh, we dedicated our lives to, you know, making a change for the better in terms of physical fitness. We're both proponents of that. I just ran my, I did my morning run this morning as well. Um, and also like you return, your return back to school was therapy in and of itself. Um, it's environmental enrichment at, you know, at the core. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for all of your work in this uh this field and yeah i'm looking forward to an ongoing uh working relationship and i would also like to thank celeste thoroughwell and um health wellness industries for sponsoring enrico's talk um and without further ado let's get to the questions Okay, so in terms of physical exercise, would it be beneficial years after injury or is earlier better? As I said before, I believe the general consensus is that one, once the restorative processes in the brain have, have been completed, that, that the exercise will be beneficial. And in animal models, that's this, we're talking about a span of approximately a week. Um, so I would say that actually exercise, I mean, in, in a clinical setting, you can be rest assured that you would be supported by the, the rehab professionals, the physiotherapists that would be assisting you with your progressive return. And I think certainly at the beginning that it's focusing a lot more on just regaining general cardiorespiratory fitness as a result of being sedentary or being you know in, in a bed for so long. Um, but uh, I would argue that the exercise, the benefits go far beyond that initial recovery period. And, and to this day, the exercise is like my lifeline. This is what keeps me going. And, and it's even demonstrated in the literature, as I mentioned briefly earlier, it's like, it is shown to be, to enhance cognitive recovery, especially in the chronic period of recovery, especially during the chronic period. So I hope that answers the question, definitely in long-term as well. So actually, I just wanted to make a, a point on that note. Uh, because I too continue to exercise and I love what you said in your presentation about uh, this being a lifelong thing. It, it wasn't just like you did exercise to recover from your acute injury and then you stopped. It extends beyond the acute injury, healing of the acute injury. It's, it's a lifestyle that you should adopt. Everybody should adopt to thrive cognitively, physically, you know, mentally, right? So, um, I guess on that note, uh, I guess when, when I was recovering from my accident, they used to say that like two years is your window to recover. And then after that, you know, the window is shut. I don't believe that personally, it doesn't make sense. The brain is always creating connections and shedding others. So in my mind, yeah, maybe the plasticity of the brain slows down a bit, the further out you get from the injury, but it never stops changing. So these things are good for a brain injured 
person for, you know, an MS patient, but even just an average person who wants to, you know, like achieve their peak cognitive function, aerobic exercise is great for them. Yeah. Sorry about that. No, that's uh, great. Hey, we're, you're spe preaching to the choir. We're coming from the same place, just from two absolutely. different provinces. So. <laughs> um, so here's another question. Does it matter if aerobic exercise is done seated for those with uh, balance slash mobility difficulties? Absolutely not. You know, over the years, I've had a number of participants who have varying degrees of, of mobility, um, some that have more difficulty than others walking and and many the, their preference was to be on cycle ergometers um you know or, or spinning machines um for their their exercise and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that i think that adapting to the situation and the individual is the most important thing because we want to create or reduce as many of the barriers that could be present as possible and so definitely those kinds of adapt adaptations are are, are paramount uh, how significant is the difference in patients who did cardiovascular exercise versus those that did not? What does the program look like and what is the intensity? That's a great question. So I can't say, because I'm not an exercise physiologist, okay, that we took that kind of approach to measuring the dose, intensity of the exercise participation, differentiating between participants who are engaged with more more cardiorespiratory endurance exercise, others that were engaged with more uh, weight resistance exercises. But I can tell you that it took a very broad general health-based approach to, let's say, the recommendations, the, the ACRM recommendations of, of, of like, you know, the, the amount of exercise to be doing to maintain, to improve or maintain uh, general health. So the 150 minutes of, of cardiorespiratory, moderate to vigorous cardiorespiratory endurance exercise a week, um, up to two uh, sessions of resistance training exercises and, and stretching and flexibility exercises. I mean, that the program was based on the general fitness principles as that, that have been taught over years and, and the years and you know, that, that is an approach that the YMCA's take in, 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 in their mission as well. So, you know, the, the program itself began in a setting in a smaller gym area, which involved a lot of machine based training, um, major muscle groups, um, resistance exercise, focusing more on endurance. Um, so higher repetitions, um, developing the building blocks, having adequate warm up and cool down before and cardiorespiratory machines, exercise machines, so aerobic machines, whether it was elliptical machines, cycle uh, spinners or, or treadmills. And then, and then certainly stretching afterwards, it was a period we'd focus on throughout the, the program. It's a nine month program. So that, uh, so that first phase was like focusing more on the building blocks. And the second phase focused a lot more on the like independent individual training programs that also involve the, you know, the, the necessary amounts of like warm up and cool down and cardiorespiratory training, but focus also on major muscle groups and working with, with free weights in, in the larger gym area and integrating with other gym members who, who were there. And then the third phase was really when we went specifically focused on training for the different events. And I, because I had this, this background of working at the YMCA's and, and being a personal trainer and experience doing all these, these, these events myself and, and, uh, and coaching people through it, I was able to design the different training programs for the different participants who were involved with the different sports and the teams. So the swim program, the run program, the cycle program, and that's, that's essentially what we did for the, uh, the, the 5K run in 2019 as well as we took the, the program that we had for the, the running portion of the triathlon we had done in previous years and we expanded it for the 5K race. So I hope that answers the question, but like we didn't take a dose response kind of approach to it. Again, it was, it was really looking at participation, which is tremendous throughout the years. Uh, completion and looking at the kinds of benefits this had in people's um, quality of life, their functioning, their, their emotional well-being, um, the, the kind of benefits it was having for their significant others uh, and just their lives. You know, they, they would, in their words, I, I kid you not, reason for getting up in the morning. 
a reason for getting up in the morning. The cognitive, the physical, the psychological benefits and the social connections and, and that were developed through this program over the years were just tremendous. Um, how do you work with individuals with exercise intolerance due to dysautonomia? So, no. sorry? Uh, no, I haven't, no. Okay. Yeah, uh, one of the criteria asked. for admission into the program um, was just uh, generally speaking, we wanted to make sure that, that everyone could participate in general forms of physical activity safely. So that, that was a screening item at the, at the start. Gotcha. Okay. And last question. Um, is there a program guide available? Ah, that's great. In the works, it will be coming out shortly. Yeah, that's, uh, that's very shortly. That's the, you know, the second study of my PhD. Um, yeah, we're going to be publishing that and, uh, and then, you know, people will be able to hopefully access that guide, that, that manual, because that's what it is. It's a tremendous manual of everything we did over a nine month period, meeting every Tuesday and Thursday morning, over nine months. Everything from the supports to the behavior change strategies, to the role of the mentors, to the role of the participants, to the activities, everything from A to Z. And it can be adapted to different communities and different settings. And that's the beauty of it. So hold on, it's coming soon. I'm excited to share it. Amazing, love that. Thanks so much, Enrico. I wanna just thank you so much, Enrico and Barbara for your wonderful presentation today. I know that people really enjoyed it. I could see it from all of the comments and we're so pleased that you were able to join us. I wanna thank again our sponsors, Pace Law Firm and Health Wellness Industries for sponsoring this webinar. I also invite you to watch our other webinars as well as they have equally as great speakers and wonderful content. Thank you again.